remember that in Leviticus 23, when God introduced or summarized all the festivals, the seven major festivals to the Jewish people, one important thing that he said is this. He said, these are my feasts. These are my appointed times. Fest festivals not in, in a way where we eat and drink and dance. That comes later on, but this, these are God's appointed feasts that God wanted Israel to remember and come closer to him during these times because God would be doing, you know, fulfilling or unfolding his plan of redemption through this feast. So these are God's feasts. And we, people from the nations, we get to, we get the privilege to enjoy, to take part in this, this rich, beautiful experience that springs forth right from the, you know, the, the letters of the Hebrew scriptures, you know, from the, the texts of the Hebrew scriptures. So, you don't have to be afraid that we are doing something pagan or, or something else because it's, it looks strange. These are from the scriptures. And, and, and Jesus, when he uh, did the Passover, except two elements, he may have had all the elements here that you can see. So it was all of God's plan right from the beginning to bring the Jewish and the Gentile people together to break that dividing wall of hostility and make us one together in the body of Christ. You know, through the cross, through the death of Jesus, we are redeemed. Israel is redeemed. We are redeemed. But also, we who have been away from the commonwealth of Israel, we have been brought near. We have been brought near to God, but also we have, been, we have a new family today. And that is the Jewish uh, people, okay? And of more so, the believers, uh, the Jewish believers. So we are one in this this morning. Amen. Praise God. So we get, we get this privilege. So because of this, this relationship that we have with God and with the Jewish people in the one new man, you know, we share with the Jewish people a rich heritage, the heritage of the people of Israel and all that God did to reveal himself to the fathers, to the prophets and the festivals of Israel. And this becomes our heritage in the Messiah this morning. And we shall look closely, you know, uh, at one aspect of these uh, many things that God blessed us through the nation of Israel. And it is the, the story of Passover, the festival of Passover. And the Passover is the account of God's redemption of the nation of Israel from bondage, from, from the slavery in Egypt thousands of years ago. But this morning, you know, as we look closely at this ancient festival of redemption, you, know, you are going to see God in bringing Israel out of the bondage and that he wove into the very fabric of this story, a picture far greater than what we are experiencing, which is the redemption, you know, of all the world, you know, from the, from the Egypt of sin to our Passover lamb, who was Jesus, the Messiah. And I want to uh, invite you, we will read some scriptures today, you know, to see the context of the first Passover before we enter into the elements, okay? And these uh, uh, scriptures we find in Exodus chapter 12, Okay, and, and, and the context of Exodus chapter 12 is this, that Israel was in bondage. Okay, they were enslaved in, in Egypt. And, and God promised that he was going to redeem them. And so he raised up Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, let my people go. Well, you all know, and I know, everybody knows from the scriptures that Pharaoh you know, was not willing to send the people of Israel out. And he was not convinced, you know, so God had to convince Pharaoh. And, and, you know, God is very good at convincing people, you know. So he sent the plagues, judgments in order to convince Pharaoh that it is him, the sovereign God, and that he cannot fight back, but he has to do what God commanded him through Moses. So he, he sent 10 plagues in all. You know, and the Bible tells us that the Jewish people who were living in Egypt they were living in a separate section in Egypt called Goshen. In all of these 10 plagues, they were exempt from nine of those plagues, the first nine of those plagues. Okay. But the, the last plague, you know, they were not exempt. For example, in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21, you see that when darkness fell upon the Egyptians, there was light in Israel. You know, when in Exodus chapter 9, verse 3, when God brought the pestilences upon the cattle of the Egyptians, 
You know, and the cattle died because of plagues. The cattle of Israelites were safe. None of them died. They were spared. But Israel was not automatically exempt, you know, for the last plague, which was the death of the firstborn, the worst plague of all. But in order that that plague should not fall upon uh, the people of Israel, God commanded the children of Israel to take a year old lamb for each family. Okay, and that is where we pick up the story. So let's uh, uh, turn your Bibles, if you have it with you, to Exodus chapter 12. And, and we will read from verses 5 through 8 and then 11 through 15. Okay, uh, this is how the scripture goes. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening and they shall take off the blood and strike it on the two posts you know on the up uh, and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat and they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it thus you sh shall you eat it with your loins girded your shoes on your feet and your staff on your hand and you shall eat it in haste it is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a sign upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast for, to the Lord throughout your generation by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth unleavened, unleavened, uh, sorry, leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So this is the, the story of that first, that night of Passover, you know, uh, uh, in Egypt. We know that the first Passover then was celebrated on the night of the uh, night of the 10th plague, okay, way back in the land of Egypt. But as God commanded here in Exodus 12, Israel was not only to uh, uh, celebrate uh, or keep the Passover that night and be redeemed and forget about it, but it was a lasting ordinance where they had to remember generation after generation by celebrating it as a festival. And so throughout the history, as they observed this great festival, there were various symbols and traditions that were added to the observance as we are going to see today to remind them of the first Passover back in the land of Egypt. So by the time Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover, most of the items that you see here, you know, were present on the table on that uh, uh, last supper in, in, the, in Jerusalem, except two items, you know, and we are going to see uh, why the two items were not there, okay? And we are, uh, and we're going to see the meanings of the other items. The most significant Passover that Jesus and his disciples celebrated was that one in the upper room in Jerusalem, uh, which is the Last Supper, as we call. Actually, it was a Passover, the communion that we have in our churches, in our congregations. The Last Supper, which we call the Lord's Table, the communion, which we call, is actually the Passover. You know, and, and, and how much more, you know, that does this festival, you know, which we uh, understand it as the communion where we take in the body of Christ and, and, and you know, it, it symbolized in bread and, and the blood of Christ symbolized in the grape juice or wine, how much, how much more significant does this festival become to us? For we are the followers of Yeshua, you know, who is the light of all. You know, who's the light of the whole world, light of the Israel and the light of the nations also. Okay. And, and even now, you know, though this has come so far, so much that even the nations are keeping it, the nations know the true story behind this uh, Passover, which is our redemption in Christ. Yet, Passover, even today, is being celebrated everywhere in Jewish homes all over the world. Okay. And, uh, and this month, the Passover Eve started just a, two days ago on the uh, night of April 15th. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, second night. That was last night here. And we had a wonderful Seder last night. 
when well so what happens uh, uh, as the family uh, the jewish family begins the passover you know as the family begins the passover the father is the one who is the head of the uh, of, uh, passover celebration it's a family celebration okay as you as we are going to see that everyone in the family okay has to be involved in this uh, celebration first the father now what the father will do is he has a role but before the father does this the mother does this what is that it's called the bedikat khametz which means the searching out of the leaven so a few days before passover or even several weeks uh, you know uh, there's a tremendous preparation that goes into the celebration of passover you might remember in the gospels in luke chapter 22 verse 8 that jesus even sent peter and john ahead of them into the city of jerusalem saying go prepare the passover that we may eat you know it was not just a thing like you go to a hotel and order some food and eat and come back no this there had to be preparation for this okay and even jewish homes this happens and what this preparation involves is that you know you remember god commanded the people of israel back in the land of egypt that they were to clean the houses of all living anything with with yeast in it you know you know today if, if we had to search out yeast in our homes that would mean you know you should get out all the bread you get the bread out of your house the bagels the burgers the donuts the cakes everything that has leaven okay has to go which means for seven days you cannot touch these items okay you should only eat the passover bread which is right before us it's the matzah bread okay and so because passover comes during the springtime this has become a general time for houses to be clean and they call it the spring cleaning and it has come from this tradition of the passover and in orthodox or very jewish uh, uh, traditional homes the mom begins weeks in advance of passover cleaning everything from floor to ceiling and and there's a whole set even a new set of dishes that come during the passover just in case if the old dishes have some leaven in that so they, they bring a whole uh, set of new things on the dining table okay so the, the problem here is that the women does all the job of cleaning okay and after the cleaning is done the rabbis you know instituted saying that after the women slogs you know day in and day out to clean the house everything as it happens in our homes right the woman does all the cleaning then the rabbi said that the man of the the man of the house the head of the house the husband will come and will just go here and there and take out some leavens leaven that the wife has kept for the husband to officially come and clean it and how would he do that you know he would take a wooden spoon like this i got this in a jewish store okay, this is officially a, a, a what do you call a, a, a tool for bedikat kamas to search out the leaven and burn it so the rabbi said that the, the husband should go and the wife beforehand should put some leaven here and there which means small crumbs of bread here and there in a place where the husband will find you know and then the husband or the father of the house will take the leaven okay he will put off all the lights okay and he will take a candle and he will go into every nook and corner not every nook but those places where the wife has hidden the leaven and he will take it on the wooden spoon and put it on a napkin okay or something holder puts a napkin and he packs it and throws it into the fire and even today in synagogues you'll find that in the courtyard of the courtyard of the synagogue you'll find one fire why because everybody is supposed to bring their leaven and burn it or maybe even in the houses so this is called a bedikat khametz okay so and and if you remember in the new testament paul actually picks up from this passover and he speaks in 1 corinthians 5 6 he's, he, paul tells that your glorying is not good don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened for even christ our passover has been sacrificed for us therefore let us keep the feast not with the old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread 
of sincerity and truth. So we see from this passage that leaven is not just something that has yeast in it, okay? Uh, but in the Bible, leaven is a symbol of sin. And for this purpose, God commanded the people of Israel to cleanse out all the leaven from the home. And Paul's, just as Paul, uh, uh, Paul points out uh, that leaven is a symbol for sin, so this unleavened matzah, which you see before us, Okay, this is the unleavened matzah, uh, which the Jewish people eat for seven days. I challenge you, if you get this, eat for this for seven days. No bread, no donuts, no burgers, no cake, nothing of bread. <laughs> Only the, the, uh, the matzah bread. Okay, so then this bread it, without the leaven is a symbol of holiness and the righteousness, the purity of God. Amen. And we shall see what this actually resembles for us as uh, believers in Yeshua. Now, the women might be thinking, wow, all the hard work is done by the ladies. And the man comes, you know, as usual again, he would come and he would just take a wooden spoon and feather and just take small crumbs here and there and burn it. And he gets all the glory by saying, my house is clean. <laughs> as if the man has cleaned the whole house. He poor. A woman, you know, even today it happens in our homes. In my house, my wife cleans the house. Okay, Sometimes I do some deep cleaning, but my wife is the one who cleans the house. Okay, And in the end, sometimes I also take wooden spoon and a feather. Not really. Okay, That's only for Passover. Anyway, so for the Passover, you know, the Jewish people use... Uh, 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 excuse me, one second. They use, they use this uh, Haggadah, okay, a small booklet. I have a Messianic Haggadah in my hand, but last night we had a very traditional Passover, not the Messianic Haggadah. There's some nice things to learn. Of course, we, uh, we incorporated the scriptures by reading scriptures. So they use the Haggadah, and Haggadah really means telling, okay, to tell your children, okay, that comes from, again, Exodus, where God commanded the fathers of uh, the people of Israel to tell the children, Okay, to tell them of the ceremonies, what they mean, the elements, what they mean, the prayers, what they mean, and the blessings, so that it goes on from generation to generation. Now, the women comes into the scene now. Okay, the cleansing is over. We are entering into Passover. The woman comes and lights the candles in the house, you know, and she brings the light of the festival, you know, the celebration of the festival into this evening of Passover. And the mother will take the match and light the candles and say special blessings, okay, for this occasion. Since uh, we cannot do this so virtually, uh, you know, technically, so I'm just putting this, okay? The, the woman will put, a, 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 you know, a covering on her head and she will go to the candles and invite the presence of, uh, put the lights on first, Okay, so I'll do that. Hope I'm six. At least I know how to light a candle. Okay. Praise God. Okay. So the woman goes and prays there, invites the presence of God into the family, into the husband's life, into the children, into the marriage, into the finances, you know, and she says this blessing. Barukata Adonai Elohenu Melakaula, Asher Kitshano, Betsmitswatao, Betsiwano, Lehad Likner, Shell, Yom To. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with that commanded and commanded us to kindle the festival lights. It is entirely appropriate that the woman, rather than the man, lights the candles and so bring the light to the festival light. In the same way, as it is not through man, but through a woman, a woman that the light of the world, Yeshua HaMashiach has come into the world as prophet Isaiah prophesied, declaring the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel, a light to light the Gentiles and a glory for the people of Israel. And now the celebration of Passover begins. Praise God. So as you can see this, the way I'm sitting here on the thing, you know, the family, if, if you know, if, I, if we were Jewish, if we were Jewish, my family, my, my wife, my children, you know, 
uh, they would sit around the table and the Passover, it, since it's a family festival, you know, uh, the family sits around the dinner table and the father has a special role in the Passover. He puts on a special garment on him, which is called the kiddo. And he also has a cap, which are the li- made, of, of li- made of linen. As you can see in the Torah, God commanded the priest to wear the linen garments. So the father, as he wears the linen garment, he's declaring to the family and declaring to God, declaring to himself that he's the priest of the family. He's the one who's between God and his wife, between God and his children. And he has to perform this priestly duty. Okay, so so this is a special service. So he, he wears this special garment. Now, it's not the, not just the mother who lights the candles, or not just the mother's job and the father's, but the children also have wonderful work here. What are those things? The children, you know, they come up with four questions that are usually asked by the youngest child. And, and all these four questions serve as the basis for the retelling of the whole story, which is actually called the Magid, okay, the Passover story. And the father tells it to his entire family. The first, first question is this. Why is the, uh, there are many questions. I'll just take a few. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened or unleavened bread. But tonight, we only eat unleavened bread. Okay. And there are several questions. Why we eat uh, uh, on uh, other nights, we eat sitting and reclined. But oh, why only this night, we eat reclined? Okay. On other nights, we eat other food. Why, why we are eating, uh, uh, what do you call the, the bitter herbs today? Okay, four questions they have. And they ask these questions in the form of a song, which I want to sing for you today. Okay, just one, one question. That's just for matza. Why we eat matza? I love it. So that's the uh, the song, and they, they ask the questions, and, and these questions, four questions, unpack the story of the Passover. Just as these questions, four questions, unpack the story of the Passover, where the father tells the story to his children, we also have the four cups here, which form the backbone of the whole Seder. They are structurally placed in the whole of Passover, and they're structurally themed. As you go from one cup to another, to another, to another, it forms a progression, revealing the plan of God, revealing the elements here, what happened there uh, on the night of uh, uh, Egypt, but also in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples, but also in our life today. So this is a beautiful uh, 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 imagery of God's plan of redemption. So I would like to explain to you the, the, what the four cups of the fruit wine are. Okay, so in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, we have four promises, I will promises that God makes to the people of Israel. And each of this cup here is connected to one of those promises. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. Okay, and the promise behind it is, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Okay, we'll go more deeper a little later. The second cup is called the cup of plagues or the cup of judgments. And the promise behind that is, I will rid you out of the bondage. And how did God rid the people of Israel from the bondage? Through judgments, through plagues. That's why we remember this. And the third cup is the cup of redemption. Okay, the promise behind this is I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. We're going to see what this means also. And the last cup is called the cup of praise. Uh, God promises to the Jewish people, I will take you to me, okay, for my people, and I will be your God. You see, that's the promise attached. So praise God for this, and we will see this as the Passover unfolds. Okay, the first time, the first cup is called in Hebrew, Kiddush sanctifying. So the first time we drink the cup, okay, 
the cup, which means kiddush, literally means sanctification. With this cup, we, we sanctify all that follows our Passover observance today. Okay, and this is what the cup of blessing looks like. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Bore Pri Hagafen Amen Blessed art thou, o Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the wine. And we partake in this. Praise God. Okay. You will remember that when Jesus celebrated the Passover in the upper room with his disciples, he said, it is with great desire that I eat, desire to eat this Passover with you. That's in Luke 22, 15. And Yeshua said, but I truly say that I will not partake of the fruit of the wine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Jesus spoke of the fulfillment of this Passover in the kingdom. And with his first cup, he sanctified all the, that was to follow in his Passover in the upper room. And the cup of sanctification also means that uh, God sanctified the people of Israel. He brought them out of Egypt. You know, and today, Yeshua sanctifies us. Through Yeshua, God sanctifies, though, uh, sanctifies us. Though we are in this world, he has removed out of this world. We are not of this world. You see, so we are sanctified, set apart. Now, we are the Seder. Okay, when we do the Passover, we usually call the Passover Seder. Okay, the Seder simply means an order. You may think like, oh, why is this candle here? Why is this plate here? And there's some blue uh, cover here and, and, and all this, this looks confusing. No, everything is in order. Everything has an order to hit this in. That's why it's called Passover Seder. Okay, there's a special order that follows the cups. There's a setup plate and there's an order that we're going to follow in this. You will notice that there are six compartments. As you can see, this is called the Seder plate. Okay, Seder plate. And we have six compartments in this. And they actually correspond to the different elements that, you know, uh, uh, we lay on this Seder plate. So we already have a Seder plate here on the table, but this is just for demonstration purposes. Okay, and a little bit of each of the element which we are going to talk about are, are placed on the setup plate. And there's a beautiful uh, setup plate. I got it from the, uh, just across our uh, apartment here. We, we have a Jewish store and it, it's cheaper than Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now the first element in the, uh, as we go in this elements of the Seder, this, we are going to go to see about the parsley, okay? These are parsley sprigs, okay? This is called karpas, okay? And the, uh, the, uh, which is the Hebrew word for greens, okay? In this case, we don't have, uh, actually it symbolizes hyssop in the land of Egypt, okay? But since we don't have hyssop here, it is actually traditionally, uh, 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 you know, points, they take parsley and, and symbolize it as the uh, the hyssop, okay? And 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 the rabbis tell us that karpas represents life, okay? And what happens is they they dip this karpas into the salt water, okay? And the salt water represents the tears of life. Okay? There's life here, but then we have tears here, okay? Remembering they remember the slavery of the Jewish people, you know, they lived but their lives were immersed in tears. So a life without redemption is life of tears, full of tears. But we also remember that God redeemed us, the, Jew the Jewish people with a mighty and outstretched arm. He brought them out of the bondage, out of slavery through the Red Sea into freedom. And so we partake of this green together and at the Seder meal, and we are reminding ourselves that that we are now redeemed from life of tears that is full of tears by the mercies and the grace of the almighty God. And one day he will wipe away all our tears. And that's why we say the blessing and put it in the, dip it in the salt water. The blessing is this. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord, a God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the earth. 
and we part, uh, dip this parsley here and we partake in it. Yes. As I said, this is used for to dip it in the, and the uh, symbolizes hyssop and it was dipped in the, the basin of blood and the Jewish people on the night of Passover, the, on the 10th plague, just before the 10th plague in Egypt, they applied the blood on the doorpost. So this is what represents also. We go to the next. Now, the next thing that we have in our uh, Seder plate is the maror, okay, which is the horseradish. Okay, we have the horseradish here, which is maror. And this bitter herb, a horseradish, represents the bitterness of slavery that the ancestors of the Jewish people experienced in the land of Egypt. So what do we do is we take some of this unleavened bread here, say the blessing, and then we eat it. So let me break this unleavened bread. Okay. And usually they say we have to take a spoonful of uh, horseradish. Maybe some of you know how horseradish tastes, but it actually is supposed to bring tears into your eyes. You cannot stop uh, yourself from crying because this is so strong. So we'll take, I take a little, I don't want to cry now. You know, I don't have time to do that. <laughs> Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. So we eat this bread with the bitter herbs. Oh, <coughs> that's too strong. Oh, wow. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So God wanted the Jewish people, you know, to remember the tears. <laughs> Have literally, literally tears. I think you cannot see. Uh, but uh, God wanted them to remember the bitterness of slavery. It was tearful life, full of tears. And he wanted to uh, tr truly. Uh, uh, you know, experience his goodness over their lives because he redeemed, he delivered them from slavery. You know, you may be thinking, well, I was not in Egypt. I'm not Jewish. I was not in Egypt. But uh, you should remember that God has delivered us from our slavery of sin, from our slavery of death and bondage to fear, the fear of death and, and things like that. And one day our bodies, you know, though when God calls us, we die, our bodies will come back to life again when we when Yeshua comes back. Okay, now, but you remember that when Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem, he said that to the disciples, "One of you will betray me." The disciples all got upset, saying, "Lord, is it I?" And Jesus said, "He who dips with me in the bowl tonight." Okay, that one will betray me. The night of Passover, what he was talking about, he was talking about the bitter herbs. Okay, he who dips, what he would dip, the matzah bread in, into the bowl of bitter herbs, dip it, and you take the uh, uh, horseradish maror and you eat. In a way, if I ask you who betrayed Jesus, Yeshua, uh, immediately the answer would be Judas Iscariot. But I tell you, that evening, all the disciples dipped the matzah bread into the, the bitter herbs. And Yeshua said that he who dips with me into this, okay, will betray me. And you see, Peter denied Yeshua. In a way, he betrayed Yeshua. All the disciples were scattered as it was prophesied. God said, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. All the disciples disappeared. No one to be seen near Jesus except Peter, but though, but still he also denied. Now in a way, in our lives, we also sometimes betray God, maybe denying him, you know, and, and uh, sometimes it may not be exactly like Peter did or Judas did, of course not, but sometimes our fears, lack of faith in Yeshua, in God, can mean, can hurt God really much. You know, what, how do you feel when your loved one does not believe in you? 
for whom you did everything and you are even ready to give your life. And Yeshua has given his life for us. He loved us to the end and he, he the disciples and us today and he gave, given his life. And when somebody has no faith in him, you know, he's really, uh, uh, he's hurt. So it, it, for Jesus, it's, it's hurtful and perhaps it may amount to denying the Lord. <clears throat> and but in the later that evening, you know, Jesus himself took the bread, dipping in the bowl. He handed it over to Judas Iscariot, saying, what you must do, go and do it quickly. We see that in John chapter 13, 22, 13, 27. The Bible tells us that when Judas took the bread with the bowl, Satan entered him and he went into the night. You know, maror is bitterness, it's darkness. It brings tear and ultimately death. If you remember, you know, one of the customs in the Passover, which I did not include today, is the washing of the hands. Okay, there's the first washing, second washing, the rukats and the rakats. So they wash the hands because God commanded them. And uh, in the in the in the in the New Testament account of what happened during the washing of the hands, we actually see Jesus going a step further, taking the role of the lowest slave, and he removed his regular clothes and he put on a towel which is the, the uniform of a lower slave in the house, and he washed everyone's feet. And remember that Jesus, Yeshua, he, he, he even washed Judas's feet. You see? So God was really trying to show grace and mercy and to Judas, even at that time. And then when he gave, Yeshua gave the, 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 the matzah bread with the, the maror, okay? Even that was an act of mercy. Probably Jesus was... He didn't say this, but he would be meaning, you know, in his heart saying, Judas, you know, this is going to be bitterness for you. This night, what you're going to do is going to be bitterness. You know, I think like maybe Judas could have reconsidered his decision. I don't know how to connect that, that with the prophecies that one of them will betray the Messiah. I don't know really, but perhaps Judas may have had a chance. Okay. Uh, and But he took him, the bread and bitterness, and the Bible says he ate, and Satan entered into him, and then he went into the night. It was no more twilight. It was night. It was darkness. And we know what, ha what ha happened to Judas. He died because bitterness brings death. Now, this, the third element that we are, are, are yeah, the, the next in the order is the correct or uh, it's a, it's a eating of the bitter herbs and the karoset. Okay, this is called a uh, maror horseradish bitter herbs, and this is the karoset. Karoset is a mixture of sweet apples and and wine and raisin and honey uh, and cinnamon, you know, chopped to make it look like a mortar. Okay, uh, so which represents the mortar that uh, Israelis here in Egypt used to make bricks to build uh, the pharaoh's uh, uh, palaces and uh, and the pyramids, okay? Uh, so this is really nice, this is sweet, okay? This is bitter, but this is sweet. So you might ask a rabbi, rabbi, why is uh, why does this uh, a sweet thing represent mortar, which actually is uh, uh, hard labor and slavery and, and almost uh, uh, death? And the rabbi would explain, you know, because it's tradition, he would say that even in the bitter, bitterest of the toil, you know, grew something sweet because they knew that redemption was coming near even for us we have bitterness in our lives today you know in our in our human lives earthly lives but the god, god the promises of god that bring sweetness into our life because they bring hope into us you know so that we are no more we are not burdened and and we die in the bitterness but we we can come out of that and believe in god's promises and go ahead in our lives okay so uh also, you know, the, the Jewish people take the bread again. Uh, usually we make a sandwich, but I'm not making that now. Uh, they, they take the haroset. Why? Because they want to wash out the bitterness of what the horseradish, which they ate, just ate. <laughs> so it's so perfect. We have bitterness. Then you take the promises of God. It brings sweetness. Every time you go through hard things in your life. Take the promises of God, believe in them, walk in them, hope for them, and that will bring sweetness to your life. Okay, so there's no blessing for it, but we'll have it.
Okay. The last two items in the plate, on the cider plate, are the only two items, which is the beitza, okay, or there's another Hebrew word, and the lamb shank bone. These two, except these two, everything was present on that uh, night of Passover, evening of Passover in Jerusalem in the upper room. Okay. Why? Because, you know, um, these two things were not present because these two things represent the sacrifices in the temple. This is the, uh, the sacrifice of Passover and this is the lamb sacrifice, which may have been similar, both of these. But why an egg? Okay, the egg, because this egg is called Hagiga in Hebrew. And the, the sacrifice, Passover sacrifice in Jerusalem is also called the Hagiga. So they took an egg. Why they remember the egg and the lamb? Because today the temple no more stands. In 19, uh, sorry, yeah, in 70 AD, sorry, 70 AD, the Romans headed by Titus, all the armies, they came and they destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple. And that's why we have this uh, uh, dark things here. Okay. And again, this uh, represents the lamb shank point. So after the destruction of the temple, okay, we see that, uh, um, that these things were included, just to remember of the temple. So today all of Israel mourns the destruction of the temple, which stood on the day when Jesus was celebrating the Passover. Okay, And you remember what Jesus said about the temple. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking, of course, of his death and burial and resurrection on the third day. Now, that's the egg. Now we come to the shank one. This is called the zaroa. Okay, zaroa, which means arm. Okay, and uh, in Isaiah 53, 1, it says, Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? If you look at the interlinear, the arm of the Lord is there. It's mentioned there as zaroa in Hebrew. Okay. We read in Exodus uh, chapter 12, where God commanded the people to take a lamb, which is a year old, a male lamb, without spot and without blemish, and without any broken bone. Okay. And that kind of lamb was taken and sacrificed. And this reminds us of another perfect Passover lamb, who contrary to Roman customs, didn't have his legs broken when he hung on the cross. And Yeshua, he fulfilled the messianic prophecy that he would be the Messiah. Now, we go to the second cup. The second cup is called the Makot. Okay, second cup is called Makot, the cup of plagues, cup of judgment. Excuse me. Yes, this cup of judgment. Okay. We don't drink of this cup right away, okay. but rather we dip our little finger, you know, and we put that drop on the plate. And each time we do that, we mention the plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians. Why? Because if it's a full cup, it means joy. So when we drink this cup of judgments, which remind us of the judgments of Egypt, you know, the Jewish people think that this actually... Uh, it's not good to rejoice when God judges our enemies. So we decrease this cup and decrease our joy. Okay. And it's a very biblical. You know, it talks about forgiving, forgiving your enemies. This is how it may look like. Okay. So we remember the blood. Okay. We, we put it on, uh, uh, on a paper. I shall put it on a paper here. Okay. Blood. You now frogs, flies, pestilence. And, and all the other, other plagues, okay? And uh, we will cut short a few things to be in our time. And, and the 10th plague of, uh, is the worst plague of all, which is the death of the firstborn, you know? Now, God told the children of Egypt to take the blood of the lamb, of the sacrificed lamb in a basin, to go outside their homes, to apply the blood on the doorposts, on the houses, putting on the top lintel and on the two sides of the posts. Now, the blood of of the lamb on the top lintel 
and the two posts, okay, they make the sign of a cross of the of the tree that on which Yeshua died. Okay. That night, what happened is death passed over in Egypt, it passed over the families of Israel. And there was weeping and wailing in the land of Egypt like never before, till Pharaoh cried, saying, Let them go, let them go. Otherwise, I will die. We all will die. But everywhere the blood of the lamb was on the top lintel and the two sides of post. Death passed over that house. And so redemption came that night to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now, because you and I believe in Jesus as a Messiah, and because by faith we have applied the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of our heart, when death comes to visit you and us, me, death is going to pass over us also because we have eternal life in God. Praise God for this. Amen. So, Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Priha Gafen Amen Blessed art thou, Lord God, King of the Universe, Creator of the fruit of the wine, and we take out this cup. Okay, now we come to a very interesting part of this Passover. This is called the Matzah Tash. Okay. You know, the matzah is the unleavened bread, okay? And tash, tash simply means a pouch or bag. It is a bag and there are three pieces of unleavened bread inside. As you can see, in one compartment, one bread. If you see another compartment, another bread or unleavened uh, cracker or bread. And then we have the third one. The rabbi tells that this matzah represents a unity, which is like, three pieces or three compartments in one. So in a way they're saying it's three in one. And yet there is a great deal of disagreement between the rabbis themselves. Because some rabbis say it represents, the three compartments represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the unity of the patriarchs of Israel. But some rabbis say, no, it represents uh, the, the priests the, and the Levites and the lay people of Israel repres uh, the, representing the unity of worship, okay? But you and I know what this represents. Maybe I'm holding it a little upside down. I don't want the matzahs to fall. So it may look like this. So for us, it represents the triune nature of God. God who is the Father, God who is the Son, and God who is the Holy Spirit. Here is why it is the real interpretation. I'll tell you why. You know, because during a particular time of the Passover Seder, what happens is the the father takes the matzah trash, the Jewish father, he takes the middle piece of, sorry, middle bread, the middle matzah from the bag, okay? And he breaks it into two, okay? And then he takes that first part, the, the which was, sorry, this is the second one, breaks it, and we're going to do that and hides it, okay? And, and, uh, and then the other part, he puts it back. So if you ask a rabbi, Rabbi, why do you take the second matzah and break it and hide it and bring it back and all this? He, he will simply say it's tradition because they even don't know why they do that. But we know why we do this. Okay. But there are three things I want you to notice about this matzah. I want to show you this matzah. I take the middle one. Okay. First, it is flat. Okay, it's not puffed up. There is no yeast in it whatsoever. But you also notice that the bread is made in a very special way. When the dough is rolled out, they use special devices to pierce the bread. Okay, and the, it becomes like piercings, but also they become like stripes. And when they roast it in the oven, you'll see that there are dark patches which look like the uh, bruises okay so um, th this is unleavened this is striped and this is pierced matzah even a yeshua the sinless lamb of god he was striped by the romans pierced by the nails on his hands and feet you know and on his side which was predicted by isaiah's 700 years before Yeshua came in Isaiah 53, 5, where he says, 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced for our diseases and by his stripes we are healed. Okay. And when we take the pits out of the matzatash, okay, we break into two. <clears throat> okay. We break, this is the middle part. We break into two. I mean, usually it uh, doesn't come so even, but that's fine. Okay. And the father takes and puts it in the middle part where he took it from the half of that. He takes it and puts it back. Now that is gone. But the other half, he takes a napkin, okay, and it's, it's a linen napkin, but I don't have a linen now. Linen napkin is taken. He wraps the bread. But before that, this bread is called afikomen. Okay, it's a Greek word. So even Jewish people use Greek words, see. <laughs> afikomen. And it means that which comes later. And they hide it. The father, he takes it and, and hides it somewhere. Okay, just hiding somewhere here. Which this will come back later. You know, for us, this represents such an important thing, important element of our Christian lives. You know, you see, the, the bread was broken. Okay, we said God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The, the God the Son bread was broken. And one part we put it back. Okay, one part, okay, we wrapped it in linen cloth which represents the burial of Yeshua. His body was broken, he was buried, and he was hidden for three days, okay, in the womb of this earth. And he's going to come back, okay? So now what happens is, you know, without the Afikomen coming back, the Seder cannot go further. So now the Jewish families will break for dinner or meal, Passover meal. So everything is left there and they go for have a nice lamb roast or whatever. We had a Passover uh, uh, celebration end of last month. Okay, a celebration in the sense we were doing a presentation and one believer, he gave the church a huge sheep. They were, they were trying to get a lamb for lamb roast, but he got a huge sheep, sheep sorry, and, and we ate the lamb roast. So usually lamb is uh, the uh, basic meal for that. Okay, now we come to the last. Remember, imagine that we have finished our meal and we have come back to our uh, Passover again. Now, this last Passover part of the Passover is most important for us as followers of Jesus to understand. Okay, towards the end of the meal, which is now, the head of the house would call all the children and he would say, Go and look for the Afikomen. I hid it somewhere. Okay, with the afikomen that I, you know, we, we just broke, put in the linen and we hid it. So the children will go and search for the afikomen. And the tradition is the children bring the afikomen and the father will redeem that afikomen, the bread, by paying a good amount of money to the children. Okay, so the body, the bread is redeemed back from death. It's going to come back. And having rewarded the child, you know, the father then continues the ancient ceremony of the matzatesh and the afikomen. By unwrapping the bread from the linen cloth, okay, he brings the bread back, he unwraps it, he removes it, okay, and see he removes it, and he breaks this bread, not any other bread from the matzatash, we have two and a half in that, but not that, okay, and not even the bread that we have here, which we are partaking the Maror and the Karo said, but this bread, which was broken, and he would take a bit of each of this and he distributes to the whole family. Everyone receives a piece of bread from this bread. Now, does this remind you of anything? Yes, of course. We remember that at the time, very time of the Passover that Jesus celebrated with the disciples in the upper room, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. Okay. And what did he say? He says, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. See? And Yeshua was actually bringing in the understanding of this tradition that predates Jesus. It is not just any simple bread that he broke and say, my body is broken for you. So I represent it with this bread. No, he says, this is my body. 
He's not saying, I will die, my body will be broken. Look at this, how I'm breaking, in the same way my body will be broken. No, he's not saying that. He says, this which you have been doing for hundreds and thousands of years, this talks about me. Okay. And he says, you have to be, you have to be partakers of this, of my body, for your redemption to come. Because on that night of the uh, Passover in Egypt, everybody partook in the unleavened bread and in the body of that the roasted lamb, okay, without which they would not have had redemption. Okay. Now the rabbis, okay, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Now, <coughs> excuse me. If the rabbi said, <clears throat> this represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why should Abraham, Isaac, Isaac is the second, why only Isaac's bread should be removed and broken and hidden and, and called afikomen and bring it back later and then the Passover Seder continues? The rabbis have no explanation. Is Isaac greater than Abraham and Jacob? No. The, the, the Tanakh doesn't say that about that. Okay, if we say it, it represents the priests, you know, the high priests and the Levites and the common people, why only the bread that represents the Levite should be broken and hidden and call, we call it afikomen and bring it back and then the setup continues? There's no explanation. But only are the messianic interpretation that this body belongs, it, it represents Yeshua, the Messiah, is the correct interpretation of what has happened 2,000 years ago. See? <clears throat> So Jesus, being the second person in the Trinity, he was broken in death, wrapped in a linen cloth, buried in a tomb, and brought back, resurrected by the power of God, con conquering sin and death. And it is no wonder that Jesus took this bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, okay, saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. So we'll bless this prayer and partake in this. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamot shilekhem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Okay. It's difficult to eat the, the, the matzah bread all the time, I tell you. It's called the bread of affliction. Not simply, it's really. Okay, now we come to the third cup. It's called the Hageula, the redemption. Okay, Yeshua, God is called Goelim, which means the God, the Redeemer. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And then he took the cup. You know that we take the cup four times in the Passover, as you see. So when Jesus took the cup, which cup was that? He just didn't catch a hold uh, any cup and say, okay, I'm going to die and my blood is going to shed. Then my blood is represented, symbolized by this wine. No, he said, this represents my blood. So anyway, we're going to go ahead. This is the cup Yeshua takes. Okay. And um, Paul tells us that Jesus took the cup after supper, after the meal of the Passover. I just told you, we came back from supper, right? We didn't have, maybe. And, and, and now he takes the cup after supper. So we have the first cup, sanctification, judgment. Then we have a meal. And then after the meal, they come back and take this cup of judgment. And the third cup is the cup of redemption. Redemption, looking back to the redemption when God brought back the fathers, forefathers of the Jewish people from Egypt. But also looking forward, you know, not only looking backward, to what happened on the on that night in Egypt, but also looking forward to the redemption which we have, which comes to us through the Messiah. When he comes back, we'll be redeemed completely. And Jesus now, having come to the climactic time of the Passover, okay, or rather the high point, the highlight of Passover, this is the most important cup in the whole structure of Passover and the whole structural uh, thematic structure of the four cups. This is the most important one. He took this cup and he says, this cup is the covenant in my blood, new covenant, you know, and, and, and he had to use those words. He did, just didn't say, this is my blood, but he said, this is, you know, the blood, uh, uh, new covenant in my blood, new covenant. He had to use this. Why? 
because okay uh, um in the brit Asha, in the in the new Co- uh, new testament okay the word new covenant is mm, the, uh, oh, sorry, the Brit Hadasha or the New Covenant, okay? The Barit Hadasha, which means New Covenant, in the Hebrew Scriptures, Old Testament is, is used only once. Where? In Jeremiah 31, 31. Now, when the disciples heard the word New Covenant, they knew exactly what God was, Yeshua was talking about. He was talking about Jeremiah 31, 31, where Yeshua, God declares, uh, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll, which, uh, when I'll make a brit hadasha, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers the day when I took them by the hand to bring out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. He says, not the covenant, you know, which is uh, remembered, the redemption in Egypt is remembered by this Passover. Okay, okay. Uh, th- that covenant they broke, but this Blood is going to initiate the new covenant that is promised by God in Jeremiah 31. 30. And, and, the, and, the, and the disciples of Yeshua, they knew exactly what God was talking, sorry, Yeshua was talking about. Okay, so, you know, there, there was a problem with the Mosaic covenant. It was broken through unbelief, sin, and rebellion. And Jeremiah goes on to say, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their inward paths and on the hearts, I will write it. Okay, two things happened through this cup of redemption, through the initiation of the new covenant. The sins of Israel are forgiven. Okay, or rather, if they, when they believe in Yeshua, through Yeshua, the sins will be forgiven. And the law, the Torah, will be written in the hearts. No more outside on a tab- tablet of stone, but in the tablets of the hearts. Even for us as Gentiles, through by grace, through faith, Two things happen for us. One is our sins are forgiven through Yeshua. The second is the law of the spirit, the Torah comes into our hearts. And he, God himself, enables us to live out the Torah, to live holy lives. It's not that we are lawless. We are without law just because we're in the new covenant. No, the law which was outside in the Old Testament through Yeshua in the new, through the new covenant has come inside of us. We are not lawless people. We are not without law. We have a law which is far greater, better than the law of Moses, you know, which is the law of Christ, which is in our hearts. And this law, which is inside our hearts, transforms us from the inside out, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Okay. Um, Jeremiah goes on to say, I will be their God and they will be my people. I will forgive the sins and remember the iniquity no more. And this was the ultimate condition uh, uh, upon which upon which the New Testament was resting, the forgiveness of sin. And, and Jesus now coming to this amazing point, he raises the cup after the supper, you know, and he says, that which has been promised, which you all have been waiting for, that new covenant has come now in my blood, through my blood. You know, imagine how the disciples must have felt after the Passover, celebrating the Passover year after year. Then one day in the upper room, suddenly they see the fulfillment of this cup. The cup of redemption. Okay, to imagine that God is that God that uh, to imagine that God in delivering Israel from slavery in Egypt, okay, He actually wove, you know, into the very fabric of this Passover story, the story of your redemption and my redemption, the greatest redemption of all, and the redemption of Israel. Okay, and we'll partake in this. Uh, uh, all right. Baru kata dunai Elohenu melek haolam Bore priha gafen Amen Blessed are you Lord our God King of the universe Creator of the fruit of the wine Amen We are almost ending the Passover now Okay Now we come to the fourth cup This is called Hallel The cup of praise So what do we do with How do we respond to such Great acts of sanctification and judgments, you know, to deliver us, to redeem us, and the redemption itself through the blood of Yeshua the Messiah. What is our response? It's praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them praise the name of the Lord. But this is the perfect response to what God has done for us through Yeshua, and that is to praise the name of the Lord. So, Hallel, 
means praise, it's the cup of praise. And with this fourth cup, we not only receive, you know, sing praises to God, you know, uh, not only receive praise for ourselves, because God is now, we are accepted by him, you know, but we also praise to God with our whole hearts. And if you remember that when Yeshua celebrated the Passover, they left the place of that upper room and they were walking through the Mount Olives. And the Bible says that they sang songs, right? Praises. What songs they were singing? They were singing the Hallel songs, okay? Which means the praise songs, which is a designated part of the Psalms, okay? With Tehillim which is Psalm 113 to 118. Wonderful. If you read that Psalms in the light of this Passover, you will see some great things. Okay. You read about the sacrifices. You read about the uh, place where it says the, 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 the stone that the builders rejected has become the, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. And you will uh, read about uh, the word, the words where it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Baruch Kabab Bashem Adonai. Because this talks about Yeshua himself. You know, in Matthew 23, Yeshua said, unless the Jewish people welcome me, or unless you people welcome me, you know, I will not be coming. You will not see me again. So Yeshua and his disciples sang these songs. Knowing, Yeshua, knowing that he's going to die, he was going to pay the highest price. He sang these songs, you know, about his fulfillment of these promises. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Bore priha gafen, amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Amen. Now, we have Elijah's cup, a special cup for Elijah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, before we go there. You know, so this is the amazing portrayal of the Passover you know, and our praise unto God. And it should go up every day for we know who the Lamb of God is. But we understand this, that all this points to the Messiah, but the Jewish people have not yet understood. And it is our burden, okay, and our heart in our ministry, okay, through our ministry of chosen people, ministries that every Jewish person will have a chance to hear the gospel in the Passover, see and understand what we have been sharing and seeing together. Okay, Most Jewish people or many of the Jewish people are still looking for and waiting for the Messiah. And in fact, the, the tradition of the Elijah's, in the Passover, there's a tradition of the Elijah's cup, which sits in, you know, there, but nobody drinks from that, you know. And there's a chair also that is there, but nobody sits there, nobody drinks from the cup. Okay, the cup is filled and sits it's there only. But at a particular time during the end of the Passover, the father will tell the child to go and look from the door if Elijah has come. And he goes out and sees, stands a few seconds, the, young, the child, and he says, no, Elijah has not come, you know, to greet him. Because they are waiting to say, when Elijah, they see Elijah coming, they are waiting to tell him, Baruch Abba, Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But sadly, they're waiting for Elijah to come, but he has not come. They sing this song, the oldest Hebrew melody known today. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi. Bimera beyamenu, yawo alenu, imashiyak ben David, imashiyak ben David. This song has so much of uh, emotion in it because the Jewish people are saying, Elijah, when are you going to come? Come in our days, even in our days, bring the Messiah. And every year, the Jewish people stand and sing to this together and wonder if he's ever going to come. They're still waiting because they do not know of the one who's named Yohanan in the New Testament, John the Baptist. One day, the same John the Baptist cried out, fulfilling his part of his life. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Elijah has come. He pointed 
the Jewish people to the Messiah, but they do not know. They do not know of their one name, Yeshua HaMashiach, who represents the Lamb of God, who was, is this, which, which they see in symbolism in the land of Egypt. And Yeshua is that fulfillment. And our hope today is that in being together, that we will not only be enriched by this wonderful heritage you know, of the Jewish people, which also belongs to us today in this beautiful story of Messiah and Passover, but in a much greater way that you might share with us and our, and our heart to see the message of the goodness of Yeshua, the Messiah, go to the Jewish people in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just want to thank you for giving us this time to remember the Messiah in Passover. Lord, we pray for our Jewish people, Lord. We pray for our, we thank you for our own redemption, which you have brought to us through the, this Jewish nation thousands of years ago, through the Passover, which is actually representing a far greater redemption for Israel and all the nations. And today we have come into the fulfillment of coming closer to the fulfillment of that far greater redemption when we see eye to eye. But in our spirits, we are already redeemed. We know you are a God, you love us. And all this point to you, Master Yeshua HaMashiach. We pray the same, that the Jewish people also get to see you. Thank you for being with us. And I pray that the reality of the Passover, that you are the Redeemer, will be revealed to everyone on call today. Thank you, Father. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen, amen, amen.